what I want to talk about very generally, not specifically, um, is the kind of material that the Monte Carlo Shakespeare Project has been exploring. As we've looked at productions and as we've um, talked to the people who've taken part, um, some things recur in quite surprising ways and occasionally in quite um, disappointing ways. This production may not be sensationalist, um, but it does <coughs> have an element of the exotic about it. Mm -hmm. And you can look at a production like this from two completely different perspectives. One is, let's call it for the sake of argument, aesthetic and interpretive. Here is a director, Peter Coe, um, best known for uh, premiering Oliver musicals. And Peter Coe has a specific concept of the play, and he's looking for performers who are able to bring it to life for him. And for him, as he says, the clanness, um, let's call it the primitiveness of the society in Shakespeare's play is crucial. Equivalent equals African tribal culture. And the belief in the supernatural is fundamental. And he said, um, uh, to make this work, you have to find an actor who believes in witches. Well, I went out and found one, and he happened to be black. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at it is to see this in the context of an historical journey. That this is a key moment, 1972, um, in the <coughs> relationship between uh, multi-ethnic performers in this country and Shakespeare, this sacred text. Surprisingly, and, and this, this is um, a way of uh, slapping myself on the wrist for being smug about things, um, Oscar James did believe in witchcraft. But the reason for that was that he was brought up in Trinidad um, in a community uh, where all his family had very uh, strong interests in juju, in juju. Um, and a fascinating amount of uh, his own background and his own family memories fed into the rehearsals um, of that part. Mm -hmm. I know this uh, because we talked to um, Oscar and Mona a few weeks ago at the National Theatre. Um, and they look back at this as a very important part of their own careers. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, it was extraordinary that they were approached at all. Number two, they were encouraged to talk about their own experiences and um, use Shakespeare's text as a starting point for their own performance. If you look at the production um, in more detail, and I hope this is not treading onto um, Jamie's territory because much of this information is the sort of information we're putting in the database. Um, the the all-black company of performers um, who appeared in this um, tribal version of Macbeth um, went on to have extraordinary lives. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily people shaped by the acting profession. They weren't people um, who dedicated their lives to Shakespeare. Um, it was part of their transition, part of their journey, and their relationship with Britain and its culture. No less than four actors in that play um, became writers. Mm -hmm. um, one became a politician and was assassinated years later. Um, another, um, the guy who played Duncan, um, uh, was already an established actor and comedian, and he became one of the, of the great cultural celebrities um, in, in Jamaica when he went home. So those are the two perspectives that you can take, it seemed to me, as we began to look at this material. Um, how do you uh, evaluate the way the director's intentions are part of the production and the choice of the cast? And how do you understand it in terms of performance, history, and its relationship to cultural development. Okay. When I say cultural development, I don't want to imply that that's a ladder um, from, um, <coughs> from Trinidad um, to the Roundhouse. Um, it's development in many complex forms. But there's, another third, there's a third aspect to that too, which again is something very important to um, Jamie and the database. Um, how is it perceived? How is it received? Okay. Um, here's the times. Um, two performances um, are delivered with the fluency of British acting. <laughs> Hysteria, Ron stresses, and rant 
are rife amongst the rest of the company, including Oscar James Macbeth, rendering much of the production as obscure to newcomers as its tricks are calculated to irritate the rest of us. So it was seen as um, <coughs> not very good. Not very good in terms of the concept. What are these Africans doing in Shakespeare? And not very good in terms of the performance. These people are not trained. They're not capable. And as you look at the career of Mr. Irving Wardle as it happens, you discover this is not an untypical performance uh, judgment by him. I'll come back to that in a second, but I want to say that um, the basic strategy of this performance, um, and it's also true of the, um, the famous voodoo Macbeth that, or that Orson Welles um, directed um, back in the 1930s in New York, um, it's to see um, a justification for casting black people. There has to be an explanation. When the tricycle um, did Macbeth in the 1990s, the Financial Times said um, uh, that they were disturbed and troubled by the racial casting. Why was Macbeth black? Why wasn't Lady Macbeth black? Um, why did um, uh, Macduff, who was black, have white children? Why were there Asians in it? And the review goes on to say, um, none of this actually um, handicaps the production in any way at all. And I want to know why. Because that particular critic was, I think, willfully unable um, to see how the theatre must be a reflection of the society itself, its contradictions, its variety, and its development. And there need not be a justification. Well, that's why this, this project has been thrilling. And my dinner um, with Mona and Oscar was one of the greatest occasions of my entire life. And I'll tell you about it one day if the tape recorders have turned off. <laughs> but how depressing um, to know that <coughs> the Royal Shakespeare Company is casting a largely black company at Stratford this year to celebrate Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his death um, with a mainly black cast um, and if you read um, <coughs> the blog in The Guardian a couple of days ago, you'll see that um, steps are taken there to, to justify and explain um, the use of black performers. In, nine, I was gonna say in 1999, <laughs> uh, it was odd. <laughs> in 2016, it's very odd. I'd say it's criminal. Um, not that the intentions are bad, but that time and time again we find directors um, seeing multiculturalism as a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do in the performance this afternoon is we're going to give you the, um, the words of Paul Robeson as he battled against prejudice to establish Shakespeare at all as an area where, uh, where colored performers had a right to, to perform. Mm -hmm. Um, but we'll also give you the words of many of the people that we've spoken to. Um, people like Mona, people like Oscar, um, uh, people who sometimes were very pleased to be asked about their performances. Um, and I'm glad to say that they saw this as a, an important production in many ways that I hadn't perceived at all. Um, they saw it as a production about the winds of change that they were working in the, in the early 1970s at a time when Africa was taking a bigger place in people's awareness of, of the world and its geopolitics. Um, for them, it was politically important. But the one thing that um, Peter Coe could not have told the TV audience um, was what the effect for them would be. Because both those performers are not simply actors, they're not simply performers. Um, both um, Mona Hammond and Oscar James went on to form, to, to um, co-form, if you like, to be, to be partners in the formation of black companies <coughs> later on in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And also, um, looking simply at that production, um, Mona Hammond is not, quote, black. The indication of Peter Coe's, um, I found a black man, is that he must have been African. In fact, you know, he's from Trinidad. Um, she is of mixed ethnicity. She's partly Asian. So what we're talking about is not a simple story of black versus white, of um, uh, 
tradition versus exoticism or sensationalism. We're talking about the rich, complex evolution of our own world and the way that Shakespeare can be a way of articulating that. So let's hope that the RSC um, produce a production that is better than their, um, than their concept. And I know they will, because those performers are fantastic. Okay? And the tragedy, I think, but so, so, uh, is that um, they are given limited opportunities um, to perform Shakespeare. Maybe that's not a great loss. Um, we'll be talking later on about the way that um, uh, Shakespeare can be seen as a tool of British culture being imposed on people. But the important point is that there is a story here that we are proud to tell. And I hope you'll hear something more about that in just a moment. Just one more thing. In 1972, that year, um, a production directed by Charles Maravitz, American director in London called Anathello, um, presented Othello alongside an Iago played by a black actor, the great Anton Phillips. That happened at Stratford last year, and people were saying, history is being made. Um, last year, Trevor Nunn directed The Wars of the Roses with an all-white cast. In 1972, um, so I'm sure um, we'll be hearing about in a minute, um, uh, he made serious attempts and has done for most of his career um, to enlarge the groupings of people, uh, the range of performers who could do Shakespeare. And in 1972, from South Africa, came a production of Macbeth, a black production, a tribal production called Mbatha, um, which had a sensational effect in British um, theatre. And I want to stress that because I want to stress again um, that we are talking about the expansion of Shakespeare and the clarification of what Shakespeare can mean to the diversity of people that we all are around the world as well as here. Thank you.